from Dora the Explorer. In case you didn't know. No, it's so big. If you want to paint it later, I'll give it to you and you can paint it later. So we'll do a demo with her later. So I'm showing this to you now because later it's going to be a bit complicated. This uh, piece of artwork is actually a line and some other stuff will have a Dora follow the line as part of the and you can get everything organized here.
and then they have to program the robot to do something. Anybody want to guess? <laughs> they need to follow the line, right? So the point is the robot needs to follow the line, it's going to hit the wall at the end of the line, you can't see it here yet. It's going to turn around and it's going to go back. Okay, very simple. Let's start the video and see what happens. So these are two groups. They are using, in the end, exactly the same hardware. This is exactly the same hardware. So the difference you see in behavior is simply because of the software. Okay, so the first one was a bit fast, so let's do it again. Same hardware. So one group programmed it one way, the other group programmed it the other way. They had the same amount of time to do it. The hardware is identically the same. And now the question is who's going to win? Any bets? Left, right, left, right. Any bets? Speed or more, more than double the speed. They have to do this. Sorry, I didn't say that. Right. They have to do this for time. There's a price. They have a little competition, and the guy with the first one wins a small prize, etc., etc. So the point is, they have to do this as fast as possible. With the same hardware, they get double the speed. So the point is not only software is important, the software also has to be good. Because if you have good software, this will give you the edge and your robot will perform much better. In this simple case, twice the speed. Alright. So I, I have a background in software engineering. Software engineering you usually say, okay, yeah, this is about time, this money, all that kind of story, but I don't work in industry, I work in academia, so I need to talk about research, time is research. So what do I do when I do research? Actually, I'm trying to use my uh, limited resources here on top, my brain power. I'm trying to use my brain power to get to a research result. Right? So this brain power, actually, when I am thinking about doing research and trying to do research, what am I doing? I'm trying to solve two things. I'm trying to solve the complexity fundamentally inherent in the research thing that I'm trying to solve, right? That's the research part. But that's not everything. We are working with these guys, we are working with robots, we are working with other pieces of hardware. There's always some issue with technology. So one example, our wonderful, very expensive robot has been broken for the last two weeks. Why? Inside of the robot, in the bottom in the base, there are two Linux PCs. And two weeks ago, the Linux PCs stopped booting. Just like that. And you can't access them because they're inside the robot. You can't just plug in the screen because why would you want to do that? Huh? So you need to take them out, which is an afternoon of work, plug in the screen, the screen, turn it on, and it says BIOS error, press the one to continue. <laughs> on both of the PCs. So you press the one to continue. It boots, everything's fine, you turn off the robot, you turn it on again, bios error, person want to continue. What happened? The little battery that keeps the memory, the CMOS battery, died. Both of them at the same time. <laughs> so we need to find a one, six, one euro battery twice installed in two weeks. Two weeks. You couldn't do any research with that thing which costs more than a Fedai because of two batteries of one euro each battery. Plus thinking about all the time that students spend on that, etc. Et this is technology complexity. I don't want this. What I want to do is I want to use my limited brain power, the limited brain power of my students, my limited time, their limited time to spend on the research problem. So what do I want to do? How do I want to optimize the time that I'm doing research to get results faster. There's things I cannot fix if the robot is broken, I won't be able to do that. But actually what I want to do is in all of this incidental complexity, all of this stuff which has nothing to do in fact with the research question, I want to spend as less time as possible. What I want to do is I want to spend time on the fundamental complexity of the research issue that I'm trying to solve. Okay, what am I talking about in the context of robotics? Let's give an example which is not about batteries. 
So for example, I have Dora. This is a sensor which measures distance. So I can Dora, tell Dora to go forward until it goes to a certain limit, let's say up to the wall, something like that. So Dora goes, runs, and suddenly stops. Why did she stop? Did she stop because batteries run out? Did she stop because the PC inside failed? Did she stop because there is an error in the program? Did she stop because the sensor failed? Did she stop, etc., etc. So ideally, she stopped because this is the distance that I told her to stop. But sometimes it doesn't happen, and she just stops before. And then you have to go, and if it's a big, complicated robot, you have to stop it, you have to look at it, you have to see if this failed, it failed, that failed, blah, blah, blah. You spend a whole lot of time just trying to figure it out. Why did it do this right now? Is it a bug in the program? Is the program corrected, acting correctly? Is the sensor giving it data which is bad? Etc. Etc. Okay. Other example. So I tell Dora to stop at uh, 10 centimeters. What would happen if what I actually want to do is I want to fine tune this uh, little parameter, this epsilon? I want to fine tune it, and it shouldn't be 10 centimeters, but it should be 5 centimeters. With a big robot, what do I need to do? I need to stop a robot. Go to my code, to edit my code, to compile it, to take this compiled code, I need to ship it to the robot because it's a different machine. I need to reboot the robot, I need to pick it up, put it back, turn it on, it goes, and yeah, okay, it's a bit closer, but not really close enough. Okay, let's change up soon. Load the robot, compile, ship the code, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Yeah? I'm spending a lot of time on stuff which I should not be spending my time. Okay? So, to take these two examples and to put it a bit more in a research perspective, to, to abstract a bit. Actually, when you are in robotics, your robot is performing some kind of behavior. And you as a researcher, you sometimes wonder what is the internal state of this algorithm. Why is this algorithm doing this now? What's the robot thinking? What's the robot seeing? Why is why this now? That's the information that you want. Also, what you want to do is you want to be able to fine tune parameters. I, I remember an example that we did a week some time ago. A robot was navigating, it came too close to a wall and stopped and it freaked out. You want to be able to okay, say, oh no, you know, you can come a bit closer, it's not such a problem. And that you need to that's not a research problem. That's all incidental overhead. So what do I want to do? I want to spend my brain power on the complexity of the task, not on all the incidental stuff. So how do I want to go there? How, what is it that I how do I sorry, how do I want to achieve this? Actually, my main goal is what I want is I want to have an immediate connection to the behavior that the robot is executing immediate connection. And this is how we get to live programming. So, I am not talking about live programming in the small talk style. When we say, okay, our small talk is a live programming system, I am talking about, mm, let's say, a different kind of live programming. Anybody seen the talks of Brett Victor, the talk at QSEC, for example? No? Some people have, some people haven't. I'll give you a small excerpt. So here on the left side, we have a tree. And on the right side, we have a piece of, I think it's JavaScript. Okay? And the piece of JavaScript code, when it runs, it produces a tree. Okay? Now I'm going to start the video and pay attention to what happens when he edits the code. Every edit you make immediately is reflected in the result. Every edit you make, immediately you see the result. What you have here is you have an immediate connection. See still? You have an immediate connection. You have an immediate connection on the piece of code, you make a change, just one little character, and you immediately see the result. Immediate connection. From the code to the result. Other kind of immediate connection. Tree is a bit different, code is a bit different, 
from the same presentation a little bit later. What you also can have is an immediate connection from the left hand side to the right hand side. So what he does here, he brings up the magnifying glass, he goes over the code, uh, over the image. Every time that you see something that was drawn, he goes to the line of code which drew it. So again, you have an immediate connection. This part of the tree, this part of the sky, this sun, this moon, where was it made? You see the piece of code. You have an immediate connection, two ways. Uh, from the code to the, uh, no sorry, from the image to the code. So again, immediate connection. <laughs> this is what I want. This is what I want with this kind of machine. This is why we created live robot program. So this is work together with my PhD student Miguel Campusano and also now recently um, Pablo Estefan. Miguel has been working on this longer. Pablo started uh, more recently. This has been presented at some conference, and some of the slides here are from the conference talk. But uh, I made it a bit more different. I am not going to talk about the big research things here because. It's not really for that. But if you are interested, please come talk to me and show you some other slides which are just as beautiful as this one, where I explain things more, etc. Et I'm glad to talk about this for a long time. For now, I'll just talk about three fundamentals of uh, live robot programming or LRP. First, it's a live programming language, live programming in the sense of the things that you saw in the videos before, right? The red video style, I don't know how you want to call it. What we are interested in doing is we want to code the behavior of the robot. I am not interested in image analysis algorithms. I am not interested in trying to figure out the map of this room. I am not interested in machine learning. I am not interested in all of this very heavy mathematical kind of stuff. This is very cool and you need it, but it's not what I am interested in. What I want to do is I want to use these things and on top of that, create some kind of behavior so that the robot does interesting things for me. For example, fetch me. How are you going to write code in LRP? You're going to use state machines, the state machine paradigm. Actually, they're going to be nested state machines. Why? There are a bunch of research reasons behind that. I won't bore you with that here. I'll just, um, I can talk about it later if you want, okay? So let's show a little example and why I start the video. I'm actually going to start setting up here because Doga is a bit slow to boot. Actually, I'll do that now. Um, so here we have an earlier version of the integrated development environment. This is written in file. On the left hand side you write code. In the middle, or below machines, it shows you a hierarchy of the nested machine. This is a Mossal drawing. And on the right, it shows you a visualization of the state machine while it's running. This is also a muscle learning. So in this video, I'm actually going to write the code for the TikTok of an old-fashioned analog function. So, and it's just to set up here. So you see, see it here. The moment that I made the machine, it came into the list of machines. The moment that I made the state, you see it in the list of states. Here I'm making a transition, 500 milliseconds. After 500 milliseconds, you go from T to top. The moment that this transition is made, you see it in the graph.
So okay, in the meantime, I'll talk a bit about this. This is the latest generation of the of the Lego Mindstorms. These are very interesting in the fact that it's uh, in, in the end it's a small Linux machine, and what you can do is you can connect to it over Wi-Fi. So here I have a little Wi-Fi dongle, and uh, this, that's my Wi-Fi base station. So what I can do now is I can, can connect to this machine over Wi-Fi, and I can do remote control from the computer. So actually. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use LRP to give this guy instructions and he's going to be in Fado and I'm using a Linux word on Jetstorm to be able to uh, communicate with this guy. Just a second. Nobody going to reach now. No, actually, it should work, but it's not going to give you any access to the outside. So, okay, this guy is on, this guy is on, this guy is on. So, what I can do is just start up the interpreter. The interpreter is going to ask me for the IP address of this guy. And the IP address of this guy is 087. Yeah, same mm -hmm. one. So get you at the bottom a little dialogue user interface that shows me that I'm actually connected, which is a good idea. Yeah. So you write code here. Um, I tried to make the font bigger, uh, but I couldn't. It's in Rubik, and I don't know how with the settings of file you can uh, basically uh, increase the font size. So we have to do it like this for now. In the end, later on, if you want to have a look at the exact source code, we can go through it, it's not a problem. So, okay. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a number of variables because what I will want to do is I will want to talk to the sensors, I will want to talk to the motors. Okay. So I'm going to create variables for the sensors and motors. I'm going to just copy paste because otherwise it's going to take too long. So a bunch of uh, variables here, the sensor is the sensor number 3, sensor number 3 is actually the sensor connected to port 3, which is this one, that's the color sensor. Okay. It's pointing towards the ground, so if it's on top of the line, it will detect that it's black, if it's on, not on top of the line in white, it will detect that it's white. There are two motors here, one that drives this wheel, one that drives that wheel, so if you want the robot to go that way, just turn that wheel road to go that way the other way around. Easy. Well, differential drive is actually one of the most simple ways to have a robot. Okay, so there are many complicated ways in which we can implement the simple behavior of following a line. You can get very, very complicated if you want, but we don't have time here, I don't want to bore you, so I'm going to do something stupid that works. The thing that is stupid that works is, let me show you the line. We'll start here, and if we are seeing white, that means we need to turn that way until we see black. If we see black, that means we need to turn that way until we see white. When we see the white, we go black. So it's actually kind of bouncing off of the line. Okay? So that's a very simple state machine. Let's write the state machine. So 
now it's not growing anything because it's syntactically correct. At the moment, it sees something syntactically correct and tries to grow. When you're in black, you will do something. When you're in white, you will do another thing. How do you know if you're in black or in white? It depends on what the sensor tells you. So let's do that first. <coughs> when I see black and I'm in white, I will go to the black state. When I see white and I'm in black, I will go to the white state. So there are two arrows from one state to the other if you're not where you think you should be. How can you know this? To know this, you have to read the sensor. And this is where it gets really interesting. So, when you write states and state machines, you think about the classical things. You have a state, you have a machine, you have transitions, and basically that's it, right? But at some point, I need to talk to this guy. I need to talk to the motor, I need to talk to the sensor, I need to be able to determine if I am actually seeing white, if I am actually seeing black. This I cannot express in the state machine paradigm. What I need there is a complete language. So what's the option that we have here? Let me do a little zoom. Everything that we write in Bratton brackets is standard small talk code. So everywhere where you can put this some, some kind of bracket, which is when you declare a variable, for example here, or for example here, this is standard small talk code. This can compile to some to white codes, this gets executed. So we have small talk inside of the language. Which is useful when you want to do stuff like this. And also useful when you want to move the dark to the motors, which you do in the second phase. Okay, I, I have a machine. It's not doing anything right now because I haven't kicked it into motion yet. How do I kick a machine into motion? I tell it, okay, your start state, where you need to start, is here. I'll do that. The moment I paste this line, the visualization on the right will change because the machine will kick into action and the actual state in which the machine is is highlighted. So now the machine is in the white state. Why is the machine in the white state? Because first of all I told it to start in white, right? And also it's seeing right, white right now. So if I move the robot over the line, Transition is going to trigger it going to back. It did, yes, it did. So we have the basic logic, right, of it can see white, it can see black, you can move it here, you can move it here, etc. etc. Good. Now we need the robot to start doing things. Right? So that's also where we again can write small talk code, for example. States, if you can give them blocks of small talk code to execute, to execute when you enter the state, to execute when you leave the state, or to execute when you are in the state. And this block of code should be short because when you're in the state, it's actually going to iterate and execute this block continuously at the rate specified here at the bottom, which is the standards now. So now what I'm saying, okay, if you are going out of white, you need to stop your motors. Okay, so nothing is happening right now because it's in white, stop, I'm not going to do anything. Let's do something interesting, let's make it move. So what am I saying here? Let me zoom. I'm in white. When I go into white, I'm going to tell it to start the right motor at the slow speed, which is defined higher up. I'm going to tell it to start the left speed and at the left motor at the normal speed multiplied by 2, which is also defined higher up. Okay. 
So when I close this parenthesis, it's going to be active. It's actually going to go into the white state, which means it will start running the motors, and it will run the motors until it's no longer in white. And when it's no longer in white,